So let me just again put the spotlight on me. So welcome to everyone who's, who's joined us. This is today is the, the third uh, leadership coaching roundtable discussion. So just to for people maybe the first time who's joining, um, I had this idea a few months ago by thinking that you know at USB with the infill in, in management coaching, we do I think we do a great job to prepare coaches. Um, into the marketplace. And I wanted us to become more of a center of uh, collaboration among coaches and coaching purchases of coaching services uh, and sort of an intellectual and research center, but also discussing topics relevant to coaches in South Africa specifically, because we uh, find that uh, not everything that is relevant to the rest of the world always applies in South Africa. So this is the third edition. We have a YouTube channel. So if you go to USB's YouTube uh, channel, you will see there's a, a playlist specifically to the Leadership Coaching Roundtable events, if you maybe want to have a look at the previous uh, recordings we've made. So today, um, I thought of taking on a topic that is uh, close to my heart in the sense that I believe, I don't want to put words in the mouth of the speakers, but something that can help us in our quest of professionalizing coaching. Because if you are serious about coaching as I am, I think this is something that, that we're all uh, uh, looking into and that we're all interested in. And I think the topic of the day of whether to credential through a coaching body or not to credential is uh, something that, that, is, that needs this more discussion and more information on. And to help us with that, I managed to um, convince two participants. So um, first of all, uh, Cindy, and apologies if I don't pronounce your surname correctly, um, Mutu Karapan, is that, is that acceptable? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, she, she represents um, the ICF um, in South Africa. And uh, then I also invited Andre Retief from Comensa. So I thought it would be interesting to have the two main coaching bodies in South Africa and to get their perspective on this whole thing around uh, credentialing, what it means and, and uh, whether we should or not. So I'm going to start now by um, asking... Um, each of the of the panelists today to introduce themselves briefly. So, Cindy, we can start with you. Um, you know, if you can just introduce yourself to the audience, tell us a bit more about your background and also um, your your you know your life as a coach and specifically your involvement with ICF. Thank you, Cindy. Okay. Hello, everyone. Lovely to be here with you. My name is Cindy, and I'm a master certified coach with ICF. My coach training started in 2005, and I am credentialed since 2006. Um, so credentialed for a long time, a member of the ICF for a long time, um, I think over 15 or 16 years now, and constantly, but I like the process of credentialing because it helps me update myself, improve myself, and keep abreast with the latest of um, standards for our profession or ethics around our profession. Um, but it's, it's much more than that. I like the thought leadership space within our profession. Um, what was the other question you asked? My involvement with ICF has been on many, many levels. Uh, with Global, I've been involved in updating the ICF core competencies um, directly involved and in many other task forces. Locally, I'm, I have been involved in the local chapter for the past seven years. Um, in 2018, 2017, 2018 um, was the president of ICF South Africa. I'm still in the chapter holding the portfolio of credentialing and standards. So, yeah, I'm quite involved locally and globally. Right, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. We're very glad to have some of your experience and background on the panel today. And then, Andre, over to you. Um, tell us a bit more about yourself, your background, and your involvement in Comenza. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andre Retief, and yeah, I've been coaching since 2011 and also certified coach credentialed and I also train coaches and mentors so I really am passionate about what I do in that field 
and my involvement with Comensa started in 2013 and as a normal member and then two years later I became the Gauteng chapter chair for a while and then suddenly I was thrown into the position of national president for just under three years and yeah it was just such an involvement and it's just about making the difference and after that I then became the chair, the chair for the what we call MACSAC portfolio committee. MACSAC, it's MCSC, that is the Membership Criteria and Standards of Competence Committee. So that's very much involved in the credentialing side of Comensa. And I'm really happy to be part there and to help make a difference to professionalize the industry going forward. So that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. Thanks for the introduction. And also from your side, I can see lots of experience. Um, so we should have a very interesting uh, in-depth discussion today. Um, the next question I would like to, uh, you know, the, I, I can see from the participants that I know many of them are coaches, but perhaps there are people that have joined us today that are not uh, familiar necessarily with, with the world of coaching. So maybe just a quick uh, overview uh, Cindy, starting with you, what is ICF? What is this notion of a coaching body and, and what exactly is ICF? So ICF, International Coach Federation, and a year ago changed to International Coaching Federation. And it started off as a membership body, but it's evolved to far more than that. And ICF is now tw over 25 years old. Last year was 25, this year, three, yeah, 26 years old. And they, this, they have created this hub of all things coaching. And at the beginning of this year, they uh, created a more evolved ecosystem made up of six family organizations. So it's broken up to give specific or specified attention to credentialing and standard thought leadership, coaching and organizations very systemic approach um, for members and for credential coaches and the communities we serve, individual clients, organizations, uh, businesses. So in a nutshell, that's what ICF is about, both membership and credentialing and holding the space for various projects, community and organizational base. Great, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Andre, and just some background, what is Comensa? All right, Comensa, that is the Organization for Coaches and Mentors of South Africa. We are a uh, professional body registered with SACWA, South African Qualifications Association. And our members basically consist of coaches and mentors, mainly South African. We are starting to broaden the boundaries now and engaging more with members outside of the country. So Comenso subscribes to the values of integrity, accountability, inclusivity, and also professional competence. And we really try to regulate the coaching and mentoring professions in South Africa, basically through a professional code of ethics and conduct, professional designations, ongoing continuous uh, professional development, professional supervision, and also access to certain resources. So. Comenso is out there for the people, for the coaches and mentors, and also to ensure that we can really put great coaches out there that abide by the ethics and the standards of coaching and mentoring. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Andre. So, and, and, uh, yeah, in terms of numbers, the last numbers, I often, in my own research, I often have to quote how many coaches there are out there. So the numbers I have in my head, let's see how far off I am. Um, Comenso, about 1,400 members, Andre, is that roughly correct? Yeah, about 1,400, 1,500 members. Okay, great. And then the last figures I had for ICF was around 45,000, Cindy, or was that increased now? Yeah, it's about that. Okay. Yeah, no, 45,000, 40,000 credential coach or credential holders. 40,000? 40, 40,000 40, oh. credential holders. Okay, interesting. We're jumping the gun a bit uh, here, but Andre, how many yes. members are, are credentialed um, as a matter of interest? We're much smaller in that sense because we were yes. basically South African. 
So okay. we got just over 100 credential coaches at the moment. Okay, and I think you also started uh, far more recently than ICF. But, yes. but, but, yeah. but, but locally, Nikki, we have uh, 445 ICF coaches, coach members, mm -hmm. and 76% seven, of them are older credential. Okay. So okay. locally in South Africa, it's yeah. four. For 54. Okay. 454, 70%, uh, 76% credential. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, so that maybe, Cindy, why you're also on the spot right there. Um, let's talk about credentialing. So, this is the background, but what exactly is this thing credentialing? <laughs> you know, uh, not to get into lots of definitions and things, right? But I'll just speak from a credential holder. It's, it's a part of a self-regulating. So ICF promotes self-regulation of coaches. That coaches will regulate themselves via keep updating their training, um, consistent um, professional development, meaning in renewals, you will renew yourself. And applying for credentialing at different stages, meaning I coached X amount of clients, I did that amount of training, I now apply for that level of credentialing. So it's a process of ongoing learning, development. And so we're part of a group of coaches that says we have the sense of accountability in how we serve our clients and how we update and keep ourselves abreast as a professional coach. So credentialing, of course, has a standard or a requirement around a body of evidencing at a particular level, ACC, PCC, MCC, and how we comply with and align to that level. Great. Okay, thank you. Andre, I presume it's fairly similar with Comensa, but do you have anything to add or maybe with Comensa has a different view or similar view to ICA? I think it's very much on the same basis. Um, professionalism, benchmark of standards, and it's basically a designation that's obtained by a member or a coach that's effectively displayed the behavioral standards as required by SACWA and also then being bound by the Comenso Code of Ethics. Okay, great. So Andre, maybe while you're on the spot, let's uh, swap it around a bit. Maybe I can ask you the next question first. Um, what, what would be the benefits of a coach going, well, we're going to talk about the process just now. Um, yes. So what is the process of credentialing? But before we get to that, Maybe just why should coaches consider credentialing? What's in it for them? I think there can be many reasons and many personal reasons as well. But it's also, I would say, a validation of your ability, your differentiation from the competition and evidence that you take your coaching profession very seriously. And I think it's also the assurance to the buyers of coaching that the coach is not just following their own processes. And I think it would also prevent malpractice in coaching. So it basically sets a standard out there, out there for the buyers of coaching organizations, et cetera, that if they hire a credential coach, they should know then what they are getting, that this person are proficient in the standards of coaching. Okay, great, thanks. Cindy, anything you want to add to why you think coaches could be credentialed? I'll say it simply. Andre and Nikki. I won't just go choose a profession to work with or a professional to work with. That's not. That's not qualified or trained that meets a particular standard. So I wouldn't choose a doctor that was not qualified. I wouldn't choose a lawyer, likewise. So many people, when choosing a coach, look for credentialing. They look to see that you are aligned with a body doesn't matter what body it is. Most bodies have that in place, credentialing, standards, ethical codes. So they want to know that you're aligned, you're in compliance, and you're developing yourself. So they get more value out of you. Right. Okay, so a stamp of approval, essentially. Yeah. Great. And so that, um, now let's maybe talk about the practicality of this. Um, so what are, uh, Cindy, we can start with you. You mentioned a few acronyms there. Um, what are the different levels of credentialing within ICF? 
and what are the criteria for achieving those? So your beginner level, meaning the coach that may have just come out of coach training, is your ACC coach, your associate certified coach. And that coach would need, is a list of criteria for that coach to meet. And one of it would be 60 hours of coach specific training. Now any coach specific training will hold an ethical, they will begin to be trained on or educated on the, I'll, I'll delete the word train, I'll say educated, on the code of ethics right. and core competencies of that body, like ICF core competencies. So 60 hours of training, 100 client contact hours, okay. submit a recording of your performance and you will be, you'll go into the process of ACC credentialing. Okay. For PCC, it's 500 contact hours of clients. That means I coached for 500 hours, my experience, mm -hmm. and 125 hours at a minimum of coach training. Right. And depending on which, um, what type of training you've done, whether it's ACSTH or whether it's ACTP, you may produce two recordings to ICF for them to assess you on. If it's an ACTP, your training school will evaluate you and you apply directly to ICF for PCC. So that gives you the PCC, Professionally Certified Coach. Right, thank you. Yeah, and MCC, mm, this one has 2,500 of client contact hours. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> 200 coach training hours. Mm -hmm. And again, you would produce two recordings, transcripts of the way you coach. So I see for this issue. Great, okay, so that's the three oh, levels. Wait, wait, sorry, I missed something out here. On yeah. all levels, you have to have 10 hours of mentor coaching at a minimum. 10 hours minimum. Okay, great. So, so let me just see if I remember. So it's ACC is 100 hours of coaching. ACC? 500. And then MCC is 2,500. 2,500, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. So, Andre, how, uh, what, are, what are the commensal uh, levels of credentialing? I think it's very close <laughs> to the to ICF's one. Um, we have the CCC, which is commensal credentialed coach. And they are also looking at 60 hours of coach specific training and a minimum of 150 hours of coaching. Mm -hmm. And with all our levels, we only would uh, allow 10% of your coaching hours to be pro bono coaching, mm -hmm. because it's amazing how many coaches out there are too afraid to ask for money. And then we have the CSC, which is a Comensa senior coach. And that requires 120 hours of coach specific training and 750 hours of coaching. And then we have the CMC, which is Comensa Master Coach, 200 hours plus of coach specific training and 2000 plus hours of coaching. Okay. Oh, okay. So that definitely, so it's, it's, it's fairly comparable. Uh, at the top level, you really have to have, to have shown your stuff. Now let's look. Um, specifically at the, the process. So Cindy, if I can go back to you, um, what if someone wants to now uh, apply for any of these three levels, for example, can they go, do they have to go through through the ACC, PCC, MCC, or they go straight for a higher level? Um, that's the one question. And then what are the, diff what, are the what are the processes in each of those um, applications? Okay, so you can apply directly for PCC, but you cannot apply directly for MCC. The baseline for MCC is that you must be PCC credentialed. Okay. So, so that's one of the requirements that you've got to be PCC to apply for MCC. And the process is, you know, it's beautifully explained on the ICF website. Just click on what level you want and you will see all the requirements there of what's required at a specific level. And I see Benita raised a question around uh, supervision and mentoring. So Nikki, I'll check with you. 
I'm checking questions now or later? No, let's take it at the end. Uh, I think we can go through the questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The questions so, keep coming in, but yeah. yeah. So, yeah, what, what was your other question? You so, so, the process. so, so let's, just, let's say now I'm new. I've just new, finished my uh, coach training and I want to know for ACC. What, what are the basic steps? What can mm -hmm. I expect? So you will work with your mentor and with your coach training school if it's internal coaching um, or it's an internal process being managed by your training school. You'll produce a recording and your mentor coach would work with you on your skills on that recording, meaning is it in compliance or ready for that credential level? And we'll give you some pointers and terms and how to build more skills around that particular level. And then you'll apply to ICF, having met your, say for example, ACC, your 100 client hours. Of course, you'll compile a log and you'll keep it with you. We don't um, send that off to ICF with your application. So you'll go to the ICF website and you'll go to ACC and put in an application there and pay for it. And within the application, you'll upload your recording, your transcript, um, if you're experiencing any difficulties on the sidebar of the, that particular credential level, if you click on it, a drop down box will appear. Simply put your query in there. And of course, ICF will offer you some assistance around um, whatever difficulties you're experiencing. But in a nutshell, the process is fairly simple. It's on the ICF website, and that's the way to apply. Um, ICF has recently changed the way they respond back to coaches waiting for credentialing results. I think it's now much quicker. Sometimes there is right. a delay. Whatever it is, ICF communicates with the coach regularly and so you would know where you are in that process. Okay, great. And just uh, as a matter of practicality, does it take weeks or months before you hear your results? You know, Nikki, if you're applying for PCC by the ACTP route, it takes less than two weeks. Okay, okay, well. To be awarded your certificate. If the assessors that I see are listening to your recording, it's understandable it takes longer. Yes, of course. Okay, great. And then, um, okay, fantastic. And I presume they can look at the website for more detail. So this one's going. Oh, yeah. Much. Just click on the bar that says credentialing and everything will open up for you. Perfect, thank you. Um, Andre, what is the what is the commencement process if I want to do credential? Right, it's um, basically if you, you meet the criteria for a specific designation to be credential, which you can go straight to MasterCoach if you meet the criteria. Okay. Then we still on a manual applications, but we are able to do online that you can apply directly on the website. And you will receive a list of documents that you need to complete or upload, which could be, for example, your coach training log, your coaching log, and proof of all that. And then once everything is complete, we then receive notification and we will allocate two evaluators with, to you that will then schedule an evaluation session. And after they have completed the evaluation session, it will be moderated and the results will obviously also be sent to SACWA and then you will receive your certificate if you are declared as credentialed. And I can also mention we have two routes to go. You can either do the normal route or you can apply by RPL, recognition of prior learning. If you, for example, have done your training outside of South Africa, or you've got experience in coaching, say you've been coaching for 20 years, you can come and say, well, I want to be uh, credentialed by RPL. It is quite a robust process, very intense. Um, it's also because SACPA does not recognize foreign qualifications. That's the only reason why we can do it. And they require that we have that uh, process in place as well. And it takes also within once we receive your application, we would allocate the evaluators within two days and they would then schedule the session and it should all be done within a week, to, a week and a half to two weeks to be completed. 
Okay, great, thanks. So let me just understand, um, Andre, what you're saying with Comensa, uh, uh, when you say evaluators, does it mean you have to coach live in front of these two people or are they just evaluating recording that you send in of your coaching system? We prefer a live session, but we also allow a, a recorded session to be submitted. Okay. And then, Cindy, uh, did I get it right? In Comensa, uh, in ICF, uh, it's, a, it's a recorded session that, that, you, that you send in. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, so there's no live session. Okay, great. Um, then, once you are credentialed, uh, Cindy, we can start with you maybe. Once you are credentialed, um, is that now a once-off thing and then you credential for the rest of your life or is there ongoing work that you have to do? Mm, ongoing. After every three years, you can renew your credential to keep it updated. And the renewal process requires you to do 40, like professional development hours. And out of the 40, it's broken down into core competency development and resource development. You know, books you have read or are your courses you have done. Um, so the core competency ones is attending training webinars that have attached uh, coach education hours to it. So mm -hmm. every three years, you renew your credentials and... Um, Okay. Mentoring and supervision can be counted as your professional development hours. I see. So it's continuous uh, development that you have to. Continuous, consistent, yeah. continuous development. Yeah. Right. Okay. Andre, on, on, on Comenza side, how does one um, retain their um, credential? Right. It's also valid for three years. After three years, you need to renew your credential, subject to. Also your CPD points, and we require 72 CPD points over a period of three years, of which 12 of those points has to be a code supervision that you have to undergo. And there's also different criteria for the others. We have a CPD policy in place, which is on our website, where you can actually see what, how many points you get for the, the different uh, activities that you do over that three year period. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. I think I, uh, so I try to ask the questions for the audience to get an idea, but you're also welcome when we get to the question session later, if there are little details that's still unclear, you, you can ask that. So that's for the credentialing. So, so Andre and Cindy, maybe moving on to the next um, few questions, the, the final few questions. We touched on it before, but um, do you see that organizations um, and people buying coaching services are starting to to ask questions about credentialing, do you think it gives people an edge in the market, coaches, if they are credentialed? Andre, what is your experience uh, as a coach and also um, as a uh, Comenza coaching uh, committee member? Uh, yes, certainly. We often get requests from government or other big organizations uh, asking for coaches or a list of coaches, etc. And about 95% of the time, they speci specify we want credentialed or what they call accredited coaches. And that's what they want. It's non-negotiable. And even in everyday life, you talk to people, they want to know, are you, do you have some form of accreditation or credentialing? That's what they ask for. So it's definitely becoming more uh, visible out there, more known to organizations. And there's definitely uh, leaning towards credentialing. Okay, interesting, interesting. And Cindy, do you uh, do you find the same? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, with an as Andre just said, with an organisations in South Africa, the EC is always that question. You know, what's your credentialing level? Who are your credentials with? And you know, to people involved in tendering processes, you would note they would. What points if you were credentialed with organisations and on your particular credential level. So that, that is a reality. We, we see it happen all the time where there is a request for credential coaches and organizations contact the local chapter, ICF chapter, also making requests for credential coaches. Um, and individual clients also request or ask you, you know, can you send us your coach credentialed or let us know what credentials you have. Um, 
Right. So I find that more and more people, at least around 90% of the people I engage with, request your membership certificate and your credentialing certificate. Okay. And is that, a, and this leads to the next question, Cindy, we can start with you. If we look into the future of coaching um, around the world, it seems to, it's, it's uh, the latest things I've read, it's one of the fastest growing industries now considered a $15 billion industry, which is becoming really significant. So as demand grows, uh, if we look into the future of coaching, say five years, 10 years from now, what role do you see credentialing playing in the professionalization of coaching? Definitely a, a huge role. I see it now and I see I see it in the, the way coaching is emerging, as you said, one of the fastest growing professions. And I see the, you know, there's this quality attached to the word credentialing. It's more than just quality, it's integrity, commitment, growth in profession, or if you want to call it professionalism. So those are those are some of the things that I as a credential coach or credential coaches give that message out. So it's, I see it grow more and more and I see it become a requirement. Um, some, some people that are doing coaching and not credentialed are really valued for their subject matter expertise. And, you know, there are many, I know many colleagues who are not credentialed, but really play a vital role for subject matter expertise in their coaching. However, they still want to know, do you have coaching skills? Do you know the process of coaching, you know? Because the process of coaching changes from, or there's creativity in the process of coaching, but it still holds the way or the professionalism of coaching. Right. Okay, great. So from your side, a clear view into the future, it's going to get more important rather than less. Oh, yeah, definitely. Right. Thanks. Andre, um, some thoughts from your side on the future of coaching and the role of credentialing and professionalizing coaching. Well, may I just mention as a start that about a week and a half ago, SACWA approved our mentoring designations as well on three levels. Oh. So we will now be able to also credential mentors. And I think there's quite a need for that. But so be it in our quest to professionalize the coaching and mentoring industry, I think credentialing is an aspect that will come into play stronger and stronger. And it's really up to us as the coaching bodies to promote the value of a credential coach to the buyers of coaching and really make sure that we put it out there that people know this is a professional uh, designation and there's value to it. And I think with the current situation, there's so many, so many people that really need help and we can really explore that and say, come to someone that's really going to look after your values, your needs, everything that you want from a coach. So I think there's the future of coaching it's going to be more professional. And we don't know when the government's going to come down and say, if you want to coach, you have to meet certain criteria or belong to a professional body and be credentialed. And I think at some stage that will happen. Just one coach is going to mess up very badly and the government's going to come yeah. in. So there's definitely a future for credentialing. Interesting. And, and wasn't it in Australia where um, I seem to recall where they've started doing that, where um, it's, it's there's now government regulation about when you can call yourself a coaching psychologist at least. So interesting insights. Okay, great. So I want to, uh, I think that concludes for the questioning. Thank you so much for both of you um, for, for providing insight. Let's move over to questions now. Um, I want to start by looking at the chat box. Uh, chat, chat box. I, I create chat box. Um, as part of my research, obviously, <laughs> chat boxes and chat boxes. So I'll go through that. And for the rest, uh, if you have a question, um, you're welcome to unmute and, and ask after I've gone through this through the chat. But let's start with some of the questions. So Marjorie asks a uh, question to me. Um, if USB MPhil qualifications and knowledge with ICF and Convenza for credentialing. Yes, yeah, so, so that's, a, that's always an interesting question because we see ourselves as, um, an, as an academic institution at a business school at a master's level. 
So at some point, we want to also uh, maintain our academic integrity. Now, uh, we've looked into ICF uh, uh, alignment, um, and maybe Cindy, if this has changed, you can correct me, but one of the requirements uh, are that 80% of, of uh, people that teach on a program must be ICF accredited, for the program to be ICF accredited, um, which, which we, we feel is too much of a restriction on our academic uh, integrity. Um, and then on the Comensa side, I've spoken to Andre recently, they've changed their um, criteria or their requirements for becoming Comensa accredited training provider. So we're looking into that. But what I can say is that um, our professional assessment, which uh, the alumni on the call would know, are very closely aligned with Comensa and ICF credentialing standards. So I expect that if you pass our professional uh, assessment and you then apply to commence or ICF, it will certainly, it won't be a strange experience. Um, so, so that's where we stand on that. Mm. Maybe, Cindy, yeah, do you want to comment? Yeah, there, there's um, new changes released in coach accreditation or organizations accredited, getting accredited for coach training. So I think you must look into that. The first mm. webinar to talk more about the new changes is on the 2nd of December. So it's all just ah. been released. So okay. I think you'll talk to ICF more around the new changes um, and how you can now align to that. Okay, thank you. So this is very well timed. Thank you. Mm. The next question then is to Cindy. Benita asked, you mentioned mentoring coaching, being from the UK, could you clarify that is supervision? Um, do you understand the question, Cindy? Yeah, supervision is not included right now in the coach credentialing process. In the credentialing requirement process, supervision is not inclusive. Supervision is seen as a huge value had, seen by ICF as a huge value had to professional, continuous ongoing learning and development of a coach. So supervision hours is counted towards your renewal, credentialing renewal house, together with your mentor coaching. One of the biggest differences or the prominent difference as to why it's not included in the coach credentialing process is that supervision is broader and more expansive in the way it supports the coach within their systemic environment. And mentor coaching is predominantly focused on the skill development of a coach okay. and coaching skill development. And yes, of course, coaching skill development is more enhanced and highlighted with ongoing clients. So the more clients you coach, the more your skills are enhanced. So you are bringing in your client experiences into the mentor coach process, but supervision is more broader and expansive. Okay, that makes sense. I must say it's the first time I come across the term mentor coach as well, but it makes sense that we explain it now. It's basically someone helping you develop yeah. your skills specifically. Not skills for that credential level. Credential. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, then Rebecca has a question. I'll read it now. Um, the hours of coaching for the different designations would provide a percentage of paid hours. Um, how would you consider paid, considering that some people will be doing pro bono? We're a coach at coach outside the country. Um, there was no exchange of money, or perhaps in kind, same from a day. So in terms of accommodation, will that include this paid or pro bono? So I just want to check, um, uh, Andre said that Comensa has a requirement that some of the coaching must be paid for. Does ICF have the similar? Uh, and, yes. What is yes. Because uh, during the uh, pandemic and the need for pro bono coaching or extra support for people around, ICF has um, increased this, this, this take of what's pro bono and what's paid. So right now, as it stands, and this was only because of COVID this happened, it, was, it used to be 25% could be pro bono. Right. But it's now changed to 30% of your clients could be pro bono. Okay. Okay. And what is it? Paid. Okay, perfect. What is Andre? What is the percentage of commensa? I, I can't remember now. It is ten percent pro bono. However, if someone works for an NGO, and for example, coaches as in an NGO where they might not get paid, or they work for a salary for an organisation, 
and so the, the coaching hours might specifically not be paid. So every application will obviously be considered in the way that it's presented and we will definitely look at that. So we have had uh, instances where that has happened, where someone has been has not been paid, but they work for an NGO. So right. that makes sense. Okay, that's good to hear as well. So it's it's not a hard and fast rule. There's guidelines no. and case by case basis. Great. Then um, the last question so far in the chat box is from Marjorie. And I want to, it's asking about our info program specifically, but I want to maybe open the question up wider. If there are people that undergo coach training at organizations that are not necessarily registered training providers with either Comenza or ICF, but they follow, let's say, the general approach. Um, Andre, let's start with you. Do all do those coaching hours, training hours they receive, um, is that still considered? Is it also a case by case basis when you look at the actual detail, or is there a blanket rule? We will look at all of the, them because you know there are organisations that's not uh, they might not see the benefit. Say, for example, to be part of Comensa or have their program approved by Comensa. So. We will look at it. Say, for example, USB student comes and says, I've been did my training there or my MPhil or whatever. The main thing when you become credentialed is to be able to display those behavioral standards. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the core of coaching that's basically required. So, yes, they will not be excluded at all. But okay. you will obviously, the evaluators are trained and they are quite sharp. They will see if something looks dodgy. Right. And we've had someone about a couple of months ago that even their hours, it just didn't make sense. And it was questioned and they provided more, but eventually the person was not successful in being credentialed. So it's some way it will show up if right. it's not a true re reflection of proper training. Yeah, that's also good to know that it's a rigorous process, not you know, it's not just anyone. Um, Cindy, from an ICF perspective, uh, how do you handle uh, training that's not specifically credited by ICF? ICF as a level of applications called the portfolio route, and within this route, you can your training does not have to be ICF credentialed, meaning your coach training does not have to hold a high CF, um, accredited, accredited process. And on the website, you can look at the portfolio route for your level of credentialing. There is a sample application form. Download that sample application so you can see beforehand what's required for you in the credentialing process. And that coach applying the portfolio route is well supported on how to take the training they receive, that curriculum or that pieces of training and right. align it to the core competency. So there's an alignment process that happens, but as I said, it's well supported in the application. Great. The that's, course is well supported. That's good. great to know. So there is a route for those people then as well. Um, Andrea, yes. Andrew has a question in the chat box around uh, costs involved. Do, do either of do both of you know the, the cost of hand um, or is it something they have to look on the website? Yes, certainly. If it's online, the evaluation happens online. You're looking at 2,850 around, and that includes everything. That's including VAT as well. If it's physical, it's 4,140 Rand, including VAT. Okay, great. And that's for all three of the levels. It's the same cost. Yes, correct. Um, Cindy, do you have costs, or should they look at the uh, website? I, I'm going to say, look at the website because there's three levels there, ACC, PCC, MCC. And for each one, there's three different routes that you can apply. Um, okay. An ACTP route means that a lot of the work was done internally in your training school. You will see the cost of a coach applying that route is cheaper and all paid in dollars. Okay. And portfolio route, because there's more work on the other side, it's a more expensive route to apply. Not too bad, there's not a big difference, but there is a difference. Also, if you're an ICF member versus a non-member, the ICF member pays a cheaper price. The non-member, no. there's a bit more cost added on. 
Okay, interesting. So you can actually do ICF credentialing without being an ICF member, but I presume you become a member then once you've credentialed, right? Yes. Or not necessarily. You, you, you can do that, exactly. You can apply okay. for credentialing without being a member. It would serve you to be a member and take all the benefits, you know, to use the benefits of what afforded to you and then apply for your credentialing. The difference is around the same. Great. Okay, thanks. Another question from, uh, from Rebecca. For Comenza, Andre, it's a question for you. New coaches starting their practices, is it better to be credentialed first or to get your training approved? If the training is approved by Comenza, does it have to be conducted by a credentialed coach? Right, so you can go either way, either be credentialed or apply for approval. But one of the things when we approve a program, you also need to have, depending on the size of your company, have one minimum and possibly two evaluators trained by Comensa. And why we do this also is that once you have students and they meet the criteria of enough coaching hours, et cetera, they can come back to you and actually be uh, evaluated and credentialed by your company's evaluators. And you can, if you only have one, you can always contract another commence an evaluator in and you have to negotiate the cost, et cetera, with them. But that can be done. And also those people that's then trained as evaluators, if they meet the criteria with regards to hours of training and or coach specific training and also coaching hours, they can at the same time also be credentialed at the first level. If okay. it's first level, if it's second level, obviously that will also then happen depending on if they have enough hours. I hope that's clear Thanks. enough. Thanks for that, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, Rebecca, I hope you're happy. Right, we have about um, eight minutes left. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, anything else you want to know? Everyone happy, it looks like it. Great, yeah, so I found this very informative myself. Um, Thank you for the good questions that were asked um, and to our two speakers, uh, panelists, Cindy, thank you so much for taking the time um, sharing with us Comenza's view and Andre also from, uh, from Comenza's view. So um, hopefully this was informative. I will, we will upload this on the channel so make it available to even more people. And uh, yeah, keep an eye open for the next Leadership Coaching Roundtable. It won't be this year. I have many things to complete before the end of the year. So hopefully in January, February, and even contact me if you have ideas for topics, um, you know, things that you think coaches might find useful. So on that note then, um, thank you everyone. Um, and yes, um, have a, so, hope you survive the last stretch towards the end of the year and then take a good holiday. I hope all of you, thank you very much. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Andre. Bye everyone. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks everyone. Bye. So we can probably stop.